HubSpot presents the Modern Sales Leader Award, a way to celebrate individuals who move the industry forward through purposeful, data-driven decision-making and a commitment to prioritizing people. Nominations are open. Visit modernsalesleader.com. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, folks. Welcome to the Science of Scaling podcast. I'm your host, Mark Ruberge. Today, we have my mentor, John McMahon. I met John 12 years ago. We were on the back half of the IPO journey at HubSpot. And he spent four hours a month with me. He helped me to see around the corners where I didn't have the vision, sharing the knowledge that he had as an operator. Many wins, name one of which is scaling PTC from 100 million to a billion in revenue. And in the second half of his career, he's dedicated himself to coaching and advising some of the best sales orgs in the world on the boards of companies like Snowflake and MongoDB. He's the author of The Qualified Sales Leader. We're gonna get some OG sales leadership best practices and understand how to build the fastest growing B2B companies in tech. Let's dive in with John. Why don't we just dive into Snowflake a bit As we get into the tactics, can you paint the picture for the audience? When did you join the board? Like, what stage were they at? I joined two years before they had a product. So basically, they had, like, beta, and they were trying to find product market fit. And you could say that Chris Degnan, who's the first CRO and still is a CRO, and his small team, and with a little help from myself, we were product managers. And then you start to build an ideal customer profile. What we found initially is that we could only go to tech companies and ad tech companies. Then we're given a lot of feedback to development and development starts to enhance the product. And now all of a sudden you have some new differentiators that solve other pains for customers in different use cases. As your product continues to change, what you're doing is you're constantly updating that ideal customer profile. Does that make sense? Completely. I think it's going to be eye-opening to our product and tech-oriented founders that are listening to understand that Snowflake brought in a sales-driven board member, if I may describe you a little bit that way, during the product stage. How is that intuitive from your standpoint? I think some of the the best ones that I've seen, they surround themselves with uh, almost, let's call it, some sort of expertise for each discipline in the company. So I was brought in for sales, but they also brought in shortly after Jeremy Burton, who was the chief marketing officer for EMC Dell. So they they brought in, you know, and then they brought in people for for engineering. So they they had expertise to help the heads of each one of the different disciplines inside the company. Okay, so you said initially tech and tech. That's our initial ICP. Is that really it? When when people are listening, like, okay, ideal customer profile, like what John is saying. I don't need to boil the ocean and try to sell everything to everyone. I just need to get to five or 10 million. I want to get it the fastest way possible. And like they decide on tech and ad tech. Was that just intuitive out of the gate? No, it's, it's where he feels the energy. And then, you know, he, he was smart in the sense that let's say you had one person in the Bay Area and one in New York City because that's where a lot of those types of companies reside. What most companies will do when they're at that stage and they need to add like another rep, what they'll do is go throw them in like Chicago or Dallas or Los Angeles or something like that. And what he did is said, okay, but really primarily most of those companies still reside in the Bay Area and in New York City. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double down and continue to add into those cities instead of just thinking that I have to, in essence, sprinkle the infield and put reps in all the different cities. When I talk to founders and sales leaders who are going through that expand, that market expansion, and let's say, and now they want to start penetrating the healthcare sector, almost like 99% of them say, I need to go find someone who has experience selling into healthcare. Do you agree that that's like critical? No, I've never believed that. Actually, when we used to, when we were at PTC selling mechanical computer-aided design, the one thing we would do is not hire somebody that had a mechanical engineering degree or any CAD experience. We would hire, you know, really good enterprise sales reps. Same thing for for Snowflake. They just hired 
they didn't care if somebody knew what a data warehouse was. They were just going to go hire the best enterprise salespeople they could hire. So if I'm a CEO, a board, a, a newer sales leader, and I'm expanding to this new market, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I was just going to go hire a salesperson that has experience in healthcare, and I'm listening to this, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm making a huge mistake. Then it's like, well, what should I be looking for? Well, you and I have spoken about this before. When you're hiring, if you want to get A players, you have to first look at the characteristics of the person, right? Because if you believe that somebody's really intelligent, they're going to pick up the knowledge pretty quickly because you can pick up the knowledge of any game or sport very quickly if you're very smart. And then skills, if you're really driven, you can pick up skills, but they take time and you have to be highly driven because it's repetitive. So, but if somebody's really smart and they're very skillful in enterprise sales and they're coachable and adaptable, then they're going to go ahead and pick up your product pretty quickly and they're going to understand how to sell it at a much higher level in the organization. Hey folks, just Mark here. Yeah, the industry, we get this wrong all the time. The instinct at the board level, the CEO, the founder, the executives is, okay, we're going into healthcare. Let's go find someone that's sold into healthcare. And yet, when you look at rigorous research, when you talk to people who've navigated that decision point thousands of times, like John, they completely disagree. They do not put selling into that industry or company base high on the list. Yeah, I, I like John's take there. I mean, for me, I just think what happens is the board and the executive team don't see anything else but the experience. And they just almost make a resume hire. And they end up with a bottom 25% performer in that industry. Where this is really about the ability to sell. It's the ability to adapt. It's the character. It's the work ethic. It's the ability to ask good discovery questions, to develop a champion. I'd much rather have someone who's an A-plus at that currently selling into media, and now I'm going to have them sell into healthcare. I'd much rather teach them how to sell into healthcare, the nuances of healthcare, than trying to teach them the nuances of advanced selling. All right, let's get back to John. Really, if you're thinking about a person, they have knowledge, they have skills, they have experience, and then they have characteristics. And at the end of the day, it's the characteristics how do you even look for that? I'm sure you were brought in, hey, John, like we're making this big hire. Can you help us with this hire? Like, what do you do in the interview? Well, I'll look at their resume to see if they have any type of knowledge or any type of skills that I'm after. So I'll take the resume, turn it upside down, and I'll spend the first 30 to 45 minutes only talking about and asking them questions about their character, like how driven they are. What's the toughest situation you've ever been in your life? What's the most competitive situation you've ever been in your life? So I can hire a subject matter expert, but if they're not super driven, if they're not willing to go ahead and adapt and change and, and pick up new skills, they're not going to last with me for a very long time. So it's great, John. Like I get the early part, but we didn't talk about the actual, the machine and how it's running. Take us through the foundational steps of building the, the playbook, the sales methodology, whatever our operating cadence is here. First of all, companies have to set goals. So if you, if you are going to take money and you're going to hire a bunch of salespeople, one of the things that a lot of companies don't factor in is like, how do I build a productivity model? What's a productivity model? It basically says, based upon the productivity of my sales reps this year, how many reps am I going to need to hit that bookings number next year? Then you have to factor in two other things. The ramp time for the sales reps. How long does it take for a sales rep to get productive at this company? What's the definition of productive? Productive means that every quarter after the six months, they're on quota. That, so some companies, it might be six months ramp time. Some companies, it might be nine. Some companies, it might be a year before those reps on average are hitting their quota. So you have to factor, let's go back, reps, productivity, attrition, and ramp time. And when you factor those things in, you'll start to discover if, I if I'm at 20 million and I want to do 60 million next year, how many reps I need to hire and when I need to hire those reps. Yeah, your year is made four months before the year starts. 
And yet, when people put together the annual plan, they wait till January, mid-January of the current year. They're sitting here in September like, how can I even think about the next year? I don't even know where this year's ending. And the year ends and they do their New Year's party. They come back in, they start planning. Like, okay, we got to double. We got to go from 20 million to 40 million. Okay, we have to add 25 reps to do that. That's what the capacity model, the productivity model says. All right, let's add 25 reps. Do we spread them through the year? No, because we have a six month ramp. So anyone we hire after July 1 has no impact on this year. We have to hire all 25 now. 25? What's the most we've ever hired in a quarter? Oh, last year, uh, one, one quarter we did hire seven reps just because of bad planning. To John's point, we're going to hire 25 reps in Q1. We've never hired more than seven. We're going to end up with a bunch of Bs and Cs. We're not going to have enough managers to coach them. We're not going to have enough demand to feed them. And we ruin our company. All because we didn't do our annual plan back in September. If we had caught it in September, we could have hired the reps in Q4 and had them ramped by Q1. We have to start our annual plan in four months before the start of the year, maybe even more. All right, let's get back to John. Now, where a lot of companies make mistakes is they wait until, let's say their year is a fiscal calendar year. They'll wait. This is a mistake I've seen time in and time out. They wait until it's October, November, sometimes December, before they're going to plan for next year. What happens is they have 20 reps and they're doing 20 million and they, the CEO goes to the board meeting and the board tells them, well, you have to do 60 million next year. So he comes back to the CRO and says, next year, you're going to do 60 million. He says, how am I going to do that? A million dollars per rep productivity. I'm going to need 40 more reps. You know, they waited too long to plan. They hired too fast. They don't hire A's. They hire B's and C's. The managers take all the quota. So they're not going to make any money. They horse whip the reps. You get really high churn. They miss the bookings number. They pull back. The board tells them to pull back on the plan. And they continue to miss the plan. And it's all self-inflicted due to poor planning. What you really need to do is say, hey, you're on a fiscal calendar year. It's now June, we should be building a preliminary plan to understand how many reps we need to start hiring now in July because it's six months to productivity. Every month that we wait is another month that we're running out of runway to make the number next year. Totally. And I think where some of our folks in the audience get hung up is in the early beginnings when they don't even have this historical data set. And they're like, well, should I count for like a three month ramp or six month or nine month? How do I know? Or should I pay my reps 200K a year with an $800,000 quota? Or should I pay them $400,000 a year with a $1.5 million quota? Like, how do you, how do you build the first plan on these major swings and assumptions? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, early, early on, when you don't have any real numbers yet, I think you have to use some of the industry standards and then try to measure your actuals against industry standards. So typically I would suggest to somebody that you put in at least a six month RAM time that the average productivity is probably early on, maybe only going to be 800,000 to a million and that your attrition rate is probably going to be somewhere in the 25% area. Now some CFOs will go, Oh, 25% attrition. That's really high. Yeah, it's tough to build this plan without any historical data for your business. And John's given us some pretty good guardrails on that. Let's understand that John has tremendous experience with more of an enterprise sales motion where they're usually selling mid to high six-digit deals leading into million-dollar deals. And he's quoting us numbers that are probably a little closer to that context. Six, nine, 12 months ramp you know, million dollar quotas, maybe you're paying your reps 250, 300. That gravitates a little more toward the enterprise versus if you're a more mid-market or even SMB, your sales price is uh, 10,000 a year, 20,000 a year. You might be doing more like a ramp of two to three months. You might be doing a quota that's more like 600 to 800 and paying your reps 150, 200, something in that range. But those are good starting points. I also want to unpack the attrition, so, so important. He's saying 25%. Love it. I mean, the average 
attrition in sales is somewhere around 45% in the industry. So even if you assume 25%, you're 50% better than the average. That's good. And he's exactly right. Your CFO is going to look at the plan and be like, whoa, that's expensive. 25%. But you got to put it in there because it's probably going to be 25%. You might promote 5 to 10% of them right there. And the other 15 to 20, you'll just lose because you're only so good. You're getting eight out of 10 hires right. That's amazing. It's kind of a secret area to sandbag the plan because God forbid you actually execute flawlessly and only have a 15% attrition. Well, that's 10% of your staff that didn't quit, that didn't have to be rehired in 60 days, that didn't have to have another six month of ramp. And you're going to do very well against your plan. Get the 25% attrition in there if you can afford it. All right, let's get back to John. If you hired 10 people and you made two mistakes, you're already at 20%. And then you're going to take some of those highly productive reps and you're going to promote them. That's going to account for at least another five, maybe 10% in attrition out of the sales force. So those are some of the things that, you know, people need to think about. What should the manager to rep ratio or the rep to manager ratio be? Early on, I liked it to be like five to one max because there's so many new reps. And that's another thing that you have to really monitor when you do start to scale at a big stage is, you know, what is the absorption? I call it the absorption rate. Like how many new reps can one first line sales manager actually handle because they have to recruit them, they have to help onboard them, they have to constantly train them. They got to beat that ram time. How many new reps can they handle before they're going to start to churn people out, right? Because they're just not able to pay attention to five brand new reps. So if it's an experienced manager, maybe they can handle three brand new reps. If it's a rep that's never managed before and you just promoted them, chances are they're not going to handle more than two brand new reps. Yeah, this is a really good guidance that is a little different than the industry research that you'll see out there. When you go and read about the averages of rep to manager ratios on enterprise teams selling million dollar deals, yeah, it's going to be more like four, five, six to one. You can afford a smaller ratio because the reps are so productive and these deals are complex and the manager's job is intense. In a lot of cases, they might be flying around the country meeting with these reps. Versus on the inside model, if it's just an inside sales team and your reps are, you know, closing 10 or $20,000 deals and they're carrying quotas of like six to 800,000, that rep to manager ratio can be six, seven, eight to one. And so we just have to appreciate those differences. These reps might be sitting on the floor. They're a little easier to manage. Now, John brings up a really important point what he's calling absorption rate. Not really sure how to quantify it perfectly, but what we're basically saying is, let's just say we're gravitating around eight to one rep to manager. Well, that job is very different if I've had those eight reps for three years. Maybe I, one of them quit and I had to replace one, fine. Versus if I'm in a hyperscale environment, and I started the year with four reps, I'm gonna add five and lose one in that year. That's a very different management job. And that's what John's talking about with the absorption rate. I know I used to just kind of like look at my managers and be like, okay, I, I kind of like would look at each rep and give them a, an effort score. Like, okay, this rep's brand new, I'm gonna put a three next to them. This rep is 60 days old, I put a two next to them. This rep's been around for a year. I put a one next to them or even a zero. And I sort of added up the effort score from the managers. And once it hit a certain number, I'm like, ooh, their absorption rate is getting too high. I have to be very careful. I have to keep their rep to manager ratio maybe a little lower. And so there's a lot of science and strategy in deciding what that ratio should be optimally. All right, let's get back to John. So you have to be very careful like where you're placing these reps to maximize productivity and really prevent any type of attrition. Is zero attrition excellent? No, it's bad. Because everybody makes mistakes when you're hiring people. 
that says that your managers really aren't holding people accountable. Where's the number that it passes where it becomes concerning? Is 10% you think like the the best you can get or 15% or 20? Probably around 10. Yeah. But that means you're only making one mistake out of 10 hires. Crazy. You're pretty damn good. I don't think I could, I couldn't do it, John. And if you're factoring in promotions, if you're a fast scaling company, you have to factor that you're going to add probably 10, uh, promote at least one out of every 10 of your people up into the leadership positions. Yeah. Let's leave promotions outside of it and just assume like some of these attrition, like some of these are leaving the company and let's assume it's around 20%. Option A is they're quitting mostly. And option B is you're firing them mostly. Is one better than the other? Well, I think you always have to really understand why did I lose someone, whether they quit or you let them go. So anytime that anyone that worked for me had to, you know, lost the sales rep, I tell them that I want you to tell me what is it that you got wrong? You either hired the wrong person, you couldn't onboard and train them, or you couldn't lead them. It's one of those three categories. Now you have to come back to me tell me specifically in one of those categories what you did wrong. And it's not that I want to hold them accountable as much as I want them to learn and think about why did I lose that rep? Did I hire the wrong rep? Was I unable because I did a bad job of onboarding and training them? Or did I not pay attention to them? Did I not lead them and coach them and help develop them to get to the next level? Because we have to learn from our mistakes. Otherwise, that attrition is just going to keep going up. And you can share those learnings with the rest of the organization as to what went wrong. As we go ahead and like we're scaling and we're looking back and we're like, okay, now we got 10 frontline managers. Do you prefer that those are mostly promoted from within or mostly hired from the outside? I'd like to see them promoted from within. I mean, it's also good to get some fresh blood in there too. And chances are if... If you're at 10 and you're going at 20, you're probably not going to have all your leaders that are ready to step up to the next level. But that's also part of scaling. Part of scaling is taking a really hard look at your organization and say, hey, you know, this year we're doing 20, next year we're doing 40. So, and I'm halfway through the year, so I'm, I'm six months from doing 80. You know, how many leaders do I really have that are ready to make the next jump? Not only from rep to manager, but from manager first line to second line, from second line to third line. Because early on, it's going to take a long time to hire a lot of those leaders. So you have to really take a hard look at your organization and say, look, I'm going to need five third line leaders and 10 second line leaders because I don't have people in my organization that are going to do that. I better start recruiting now. I can't wait. I can't wait till the beginning of the year. I got to bring them in now. I got to start looking. And a lot of companies don't do that. And then what happens is when they don't have the leaders, they can't hire as many sales reps because to your earlier point, instead of five to one, now they go six to one, seven to one, eight to one. And, and they think they're saving money also because that's what the CFO will tell you. But what they're doing is the productivity starts to drop and attrition starts to go up. Promote from within or hire from the outside. Yeah, I think I like it both. I kind of like, if I'm looking back on a reasonably high growth team, maybe we got like 10 to 20 frontline managers. I probably want like 70 to 80% from inside and 20 to 30% from the outside. Like I like the inside promotion because it's like, yeah, you have a culture of growing your people. That's where talent's gonna want to go. Hey, I'm, I'm a 25 year old rep and you're saying if I put in six, seven, eight years here, I can be a manager and a director, great. I love that. So we need that. And it's also your, your hit rate on managers is going to be higher because if it say it takes two or three years to get promoted, you get basically have a two or three year interview to get them up there as opposed to like bringing in fresh blood from the outside where you got whatever, 10 hours to spend with them, whatever you're going to do and make that decision. It's a little harder, but why do it at all? Well, that fresh blood is important. You know, it's like, you want to add and diversify that culture. You want to go to other winners out there in the country, bring talent in from there to learn new things. It's also important for scale. Like, God forbid you're going to start adding reps at crazy levels. You're just not going to have the internal leadership talent there developed. So you need to know how to bring in leaders from the outside to keep pace with that growth. So that's what I like. 70 to 80% from the inside, 20, 30% from the outside. All right, let's get back to John. 
And when you have six months to productivity, you can't lose a bunch of reps because you can't make it up. So let's say you hired somebody and they have a six month ramp time and then you let them go nine months to a year into it, right? And you lose 10 of those reps. Now, when you hire somebody, it's another six months to productivity. And maybe you only get, if they're really good, you get six months of true productivity from them. So there's no chance of you making it up. So it's, it's why you have to hire so well. There's one other area that we have to explore, John, before we go, and something that you, I think is an area that I rarely hear from exceptional sales leaders turned board members, advisors, et cetera, is really the appreciation of what truly is your unique differentiation out there as a product? How do you embed that and hold the frontline sales line accountable to really embracing and reiterating and leveraging that unique differentiation to win? Is that a fair way to frame it, John? Because I learned a lot of that from you. Well, the, what you're trying to do in the sales process, especially if you sell an enterprise software, is eventually your product's going to be put into a POV, a proof of value, or a proof of concept, people may call it. If you can't get your differentiators into the decision criteria of the proof of value, then you're, pro you're going to lose. So it's your ability for salespeople to understand from the moment I walk in the door and I ask discovery questions, I'm almost like a great lawyer that's leading the witness and I'm asking those questions to uncover the pain that I already know about. So then later on, I can tell you why I uniquely can solve that pain that no one else can solve. And that's my differentiation. And then from there, I'm trying to create and formalize the decision criteria along with finding a champion inside the account that can help me control the account. Because it can only be three people in control of an account in a sales process. It could be you, it could be your competitor, it could be the customer. In my experience, the longer that a sales process goes on, the more the great salesperson helps to take control of the sales process. Certainly you need a champion to help you do that, but you're kind of leading the champion at that point because you know your product so well. They've bought in that they want to buy it they're helping you control the decision criteria, but you're essentially writing the decision criteria and controlling the decision process, right? And at that point, that's when your sales process moves from unpredictable to predictable. And now, once I got to the economic buyer, because the champion helped me do that, and I said, here's the criteria. We've, we've, we've spoken to your teams. Here are the pains that you have in your organization. Here, based upon that, the champion and his team have decided that here is the criteria for which we're going to test. And if we test based upon other companies that we've done business with and the metrics that we've gained in your current process, here's what we believe the outcome is going to be. And we have a preliminary cost justification. And if we can prove that we can do these things in the POV. Is there any reason why you wouldn't buy for $1 million? And you get a yes or no. And if you get a yes, then you say, look, the only reason that I'm gonna call you back, Mr. Economic Buyer, or Mrs. Economic Buyer, is because someone in your organization decided to change the criteria or change the process. So if I'm sitting in the room with the, with the competitor's champion and my champion, I just sent a you know, a cannonball across his bow and said, don't change it because guess what? I'm going to call the economic buyer. So now I've locked in that criteria. From that moment on, everything is just basically going to happen for me because as long as we can perform now in the, in the POV that's based upon our criteria and our differentiators, there's no reason I'm not going to get that million dollar deal. No reason. It's done. It's over. Oh, I, I love that. I, as, as the, early inventor of medic, it, it's been so groundbreaking for the industry, especially in enterprise deals. It's taken a couple different variations with med pick and medic with two C's. I, I know the one with two C's is the champion, your champion and the competitor's champion. And clearly that's a key part of enterprise winning. Um, how do you know or coach a rep to know that your champion is the strongest, is the best? 
First of all, you got to find out if they know who the competition champion is. If they don't, that's a red flag. Then you have to really understand if your sales rep has a champion. So the way to find champions is by doing a great job in discovery, doing a great job of scoping and trying to understand the pain and the metrics and the quantification of that pain and what the outcome could be with your product. And typically when you do that and the problem's a big enough problem, that's when a champion is going to start to emerge and want to tie their career and their reputation to you as a really good sales rep. So now you can ask them how they've tested the champion. Sometimes they're giving you inside information. Sometimes they're sending you internal documents or emails. They're telling you how the meeting just went. They're, they're telling you what objections were coming from the competition's champion. You're role-playing with them for the next meeting that they have because you know that they're going to hear these five or 10 objections from the competition's champion, and that meeting's going to occur with 10 other people in the room. Yeah, this is critical. In any sale, having a good champion, but especially in larger ticket enterprise sales where John does so well. When people ask me, well, what is the difference between mid-market SMB sales and enterprise? These are some of the things that come to mind. You know, I need a rep that understands the political dynamics of an organization, that understands business acumen at a deep level, but very importantly, understands how to find and develop a strong champion. Medic with two C's at the end, your champion, the competitor's champion. Many great sales leaders will say, the reason we get a deal is not because we had the best product. It's because we had the best champion. And so finding and developing champions is critical. And John's given us a great playbook there. The other thing he didn't say that he taught me years ago was you know if you have a champion, if they're willing and able. Are they willing to go to bat for you? And are they able to go to bat for you and get that deal done? The able part is the most important part to understand and discover. Anyone's willing. I remember as CRO, I would always say, I'm not the decision maker. I don't want to distress, but even though I was. Oftentimes, people who are the decision makers say they're not, and people who are not the decision makers say they are. They like to puff up their feathers. So we have to understand their ability to get this deal done. Once we have a deep level of trust, like, hey, this is great. You know, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Who is the economic buyer? What do they care about? Have, have you taken anything to them in the last six months? What was that conversation like? When you went through legal, who did you work with? What do the red lines look like? How do we get through that step in the red lines? If they don't know the answers, you don't have a strong champion. But if they've pushed purchases through and they know those answers, you've got a good champion. All right, let's get back to John. You want to make sure that they're well-prepared. So you're role-playing with them. And then when you see that your sales process has moved, as we spoke before, from unpredictable to predictable, because everything's happening exactly the way that you and your champion have spoken about, that's when you know you have a really great champion. And then again, the ultimate test is, can they get you a meeting with the economic buyer? Well, I'll say this, John. I remember my first year as the sales leader at HubSpot, and I had 50 cups of coffee with different sales leaders. And I decided if I was going to have a second cup with them based on how much I learned and if I learned anything. I remember our first cup of coffee. I think we have probably talked about sales for between 100 and 200 hours together. And every hour we talk, I learn so much more. Uh, thank you so much for- So we've had 100 cups of coffee? Or, <laughs> or beers or rounds of golf or whatever. Good. But it's, it's always a pleasure. And I really appreciate you coming on to Drop Knowledge. You're welcome, Mark. Today's episode was written and produced by Matthew Brown. Our show is edited by Pizza Shark Productions. Big thanks to HubSpot for startups and to the HubSpot Podcast Network for keeping the audio on. Hey, also, we're a new show. So if you like what you hear, or if you hate what you hear, leave us a rating and review over on your favorite podcast player. I love the feedback. Also, check out Stage 2 Capital. We're the first VC firm run and backed by over 500 CROs, CMOs, CCOs. 
So if you're an entrepreneur looking to scale your business, check out stage2.capital. All right, that's it for today. I'm Mark Robert. See you next week.